speaker this evening is Dr. Katie Williams, who is joining us from Cape Town. Um, Katie is the current researcher and conservation director for the Cape Leopard Trust in South Africa. Um, she obtained her BSc in environmental science from Durham University in the UK and completed her master's in geography at Cambridge University. Um, Katie has a really keen interest in understanding human wildlife relationships and um, working to create positive conservation outcomes for both humans and wildlife. And um, that passion has led her to some really remarkable places. Um, she started her career working in environmental education in the UK and then found herself in um, the Südpansberg Mountains in Limpopo province, um, where she served as field team leader and predator research manager with the primate and predator project there. And during her time in Limpopo, she completed the research for her PhD through Durham University, studying brown hyena ecology, and has since also completed two postdocs, um, both focused on brown hyena as well. And Katie joined the Cape Leopard Trust last year, and tonight she's going to be sharing about the biology and conservation of leopards in the Western Cape. So Katie, it's great to have you speaking with us this evening. Um, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for meeting everyone. Um, I just want to start, first of all, by setting the scene a little bit about leopards globally. So they are listed as vulnerable by the IUCN Red List. And um, globally, leopards have lost 75% of their historical range. Within Southern Africa, up to 51% of the historical leopard habitat has already been lost. And within South Africa, which is where the Cape Leopard Trust um, is based, of the remaining suitable leopard habitat, only a small percentage of this is within protected areas. So the majority of the land available for leopards is outside of protected areas. And this is a really big um, understudied area. So the majority of research is being done and has been done in protected areas. So there's a real need to understand um, leopards on private land and um, that's, that's one of our sort of big goals is to try and extend our research into new areas. Um, also outside of these protected areas leopards are facing a variety of different anthropogenic threats as well and that's one of the things that the Cape Leopard Trust is looking into. So the Cape Leopard Trust was established in 2004 and um, we engage in innovative research, conservation and education projects. And um, through these projects, we promote the conservation of biodiversity with a focus on leopards in the Western Cape. And in the Western Cape, leopards are the last remaining widespread large carnivore, and they play a crucial role in ecosystem conservation. And to give you an example of how important they are as an umbrella species and a flagship species in our area, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, vegetation uh, in the Cape. So within the Cape um, exists the Cape Floral Kingdom. So the Cape Floral Kingdom is the smallest of the six floral kingdoms in the world. And it's the only one that's contained entirely in a single country. And um, as part of this floral kingdom, it has an extremely high richness of plant species, so about 8,700 species, and many of these species are endemic. About 68% of them are only found in this uh, particular kingdom. So by conserving an, an animal like the leopard that has huge home ranges and utilizes a large area, you're able to not only protect the leopard and the mammal species and the other um, animal species within the area, you can also make a significant contribution towards protecting um, the high level of biodiversity within the vegetation as well. So leopards are a super, super important uh, biodiversity conservation mechanism within the Cape. There's a few things that make leopards in the Cape different than leopards in other parts of the country. And um, I just wanna to touch on those before we talk about the threats that they're facing in this area. So leopards in the Cape are on average about 50% lighter than leopards in the savanna biome of South Africa. So the leopards here are um, on average, the males are about 35 kilograms and the females are about 20 kilograms. So that's, that's quite a, a big difference in size. 
Another difference between leopards in the Fynbos biome and the savanna biome is the size of their home ranges. So leopards in the Cape tend to have um, home ranges that are about 10 times larger than those in, in the savanna. And um, some of our research, which has been based in the Cedarberg Mountains, um, focused on using collared leopards. And the males in that leopards tended to have home ranges that were about 300 to 600 square kilometers. And we even had one male leopard that was using an area up to 910 square kilometers. So these are very, very large areas in comparison to leopards in other parts of the country. And um, it's, it's interesting to think about why they might have such large ranges. And uh, the reasons for this um, are the habitat and also the diet of the leopards within the Cape. So the habitat in the Cape is very rugged. Um, so the areas they're moving are often mountainous areas. They're often difficult to move through and the prey is very widely distributed. Um, so the leopards have to move long distances to find their food. The prey they eat as well is um, a bit different than the diet of leopards in the savanna. So here in the Cape, they're mainly eating smaller prey. So this uh, pie chart is representing the leopard diet within the Boland region. And uh, the majority of the food that they're eating is small antelopes and um, hyraxes and porcupines. So it's mainly these small antelopes that are, are very widely distributed and move um, in, in either individuals or in uh, couples rather than larger um, herds of antelope as leopards are often feeding off of in other parts of the country. So leopards have to move a long way to find their food here. Um, another difference between leopards in the Cape and uh, the savannah is the density of leopards. So our research has shown that leopards in this uh, Feinbos area occur at quite a low density. So our estimates um, suggest that they're between 1.2 and 2 leopards per 100 square kilometers. And this is quite low compared to estimates in other parts of the country. Um, so these, these differences between leopards in the Cape and leopards in the savannah um, have made a lot of people um, interested in whether the leopards here are different subspecies. And um, this is something we, we do get asked whether they are um, different than the ones found in other parts of Africa. And to answer that, um, there has not been enough evidence to show that there are different subspecies. Of the nine um, subspecies of leopard in the world, only one of them occurs on the African continent. This is Panthera pardus pardus. And uh, within the Southern African leopard population, there are several geographically isolated groups that have slight uh, genetic variation due to distance isolation. Um, but these differences are not large enough to warrant uh, calling leopards in the Cape a separate subspecies. So they are considered the same uh, group of leopards um, as the rest of the African continent. However, it's really important to say that leopards in the Cape um, need to be treated slightly differently. So they have different requirements. They utilize much larger areas. They eat different foods. So we can't uh, sort of slap on the same conservation mechanisms that are utilized in other parts of the country. You really have to tailor um, what sort of conservation is done to suit the leopards that are utilizing this area. So that's part of the, the work that the Cape Leopard Trust is doing. We're trying to understand um, the specific threats and the specific um, needs of the leopards in this part of the country and to uh, design conservation strategies that are gonna work for leopards here. Um, in terms of threats that have been detected for leopards in the Cape, um, one of the biggest ones is habitat loss and fragmentation. And this is a huge threat for leopards globally. Um, but we think it's especially worrying in the Cape because the leopards here are utilizing such large areas. So because they have such big spatial needs, when um, parts of their range are getting cut or um, they're not able to connect between different populations. This is, this is very, very worrying for these leopards. Um, they don't need small areas, they need huge areas and they need connectivity. So one of the things that the Cape Leopard Trust is working on at the moment is trying to ascertain where ecological corridors are for leopards to move between different populations. Um, and um, 
we're actually looking for, for contributions from citizen scientists to help us do this. And I'll, I'll share that link at the end, but it would be great if you could uh, contribute if you're um, in the area or you know someone who's working in the cave. Another threat that we picked up on that is occurring in this area and uh, does occur much wider for leopards as well is direct persecution by livestock farmers. So sometimes um, the leopards move on to farms and if there is easily um, huntable livestock, they will kill it. And um, this can have uh, severe consequences. So obviously farmers are very agitated when this occurs and sometimes um, farmers will retaliate by killing leopards um, either in traps or with poisoning. And um, the problem is that this illegal activity is extremely hard to monitor and it's, it's severely underreported. So it's very hard for us to know the extent of this sort of activity. Um, but we try and support farmers to the best we can. So when they do have losses, we respond and we come out and we offer advice and uh, collect data. And uh, we try and um, help them to devise a conflict mitigation me mechanism that would be suitable for them. It's, um, it's clear that there's no silver bullet to reducing conflict and, and um, preventing it. You really need to come up with a strategy that is appropriate for the property. And, and we work with um, farms to try and find a suite of different uh, mitigation methods that will work for them and suit their situation. Um, it's also really important to say that mitigation methods um, also need to be managed correctly as well. So, um, you need to make sure that when mitigation is done, that uh, you are able to keep an eye on whether it's working and adjust and uh, control the situation as much as possible to ensure its, its effectiveness. So one of the pieces of research that we've been involved with and has been published recently was to do with um, some work that was done in Amakwa land. And, um, in this scenario, we were analyzing whether livestock guarding dogs that were put onto uh, two different types of properties, um, how that affected their, their behavior, the dog's behavior. So the two types of properties were um, livestock farms where the dogs were accompanied by an eco ranger. So the eco ranger was um, with the dogs and with the herd. And he was also making sure that the dog's behavior was um, correct and he didn't unnecessarily chase livestock and trying to continually train the dog. And then there was a second set of farms where the dogs were just left with the livestock. It was just dogs only. And um, in that case, in the case of the dogs only treatment, um, the dogs ended up um, within their diet, within their scat, consuming far more livestock uh, remains than when they were accompanied by the eco rangers. So it's hard to say whether the dogs, the livestock guarding dogs were scavenging or they were actually um, killing any livestock, but by having the eco ranger there to continually monitor the progress of the dogs and, and uh, to help manage them correctly, uh, they were able to reduce the consumption of livestock. So we do try and make sure that in our um, work with farmers, we don't only uh, provide them with mitigation options, we continually help them to improve their management of these options as well. Um, one of the other threats that we have detected for leopards in the Cape is wire snares. So this is something that um, we've picked up on, on a lot of agricultural properties. So people are setting these wire snares uh, mainly to catch food for consumption and uh, they'll set them along a trail and then when any animal walks through it can indiscriminately get caught and, um, and it will often be killed. They're extremely hard to see so in this bottom picture here you might not be able to spot any snares but there's actually four in there and that's, that's why they're so effective. The animals don't even see them and they're walking through and they get trapped and unfortunately um, the animals that are getting targeted are often the ones that leopards um, are consuming. So the prey, like these antelope, but also leopards are um, being maimed um, or are being killed as well. So this leopard here in the top right corner uh, lost a foot due to snaring. This was one that we photographed on our um, camera traps. And we've also had records of animals being killed by snares in this region as well. 
Um, a piece of research that uh, we were involved with included doing interviews with farmers in the Boland region. So we were speaking to farmers and laborers on private agricultural properties that bordered protected areas. Um, so these were the protected areas here in the middle and the yellow dots around it were all the properties where interviews were conducted. And um, we spoke to uh, respondents about what was motivating them to do snaring if they were involved with it. And we found that uh, the biggest motivator was food insecurity. That's, that's fairly unsurprising that people were setting uh, the snares because they wanted to supplement their diet and food security is presumably linked to family size with larger families typically relying more on poaching. Um, other factors that we found that were influencing um, the prevalence of snaring and people being involved with snaring that they reported was um, if people were seasonal workers, so farms that had seasonal workers reported a higher propensity of, of snaring on their property. And this makes sense due to the lack of a reliable income. And also farms where there were opportunities to set snares. So for example, farms where there was um, easily accessible wire, they would end up having more snares that they reported that they detected. Um, so these sort of factors are definitely pushing people to snare and it's really important that we understand these socioeconomic reasons why people are involved with this practice so that you can come up with mitigation strategies that don't just remove snares out of the habitat but also address the, the real drivers for why it's happening. Um, one of the other questions that was asked during this questionnaire was which animals are being targeted when snares are being set. And the respondents told us that the majority of the time they were trying to catch small antelope and porcupine. So those were the two biggest things they were trying to get. And uh, if you compare that again to the diet of leopards in the Boland, um, these small antelope like Griesbach and Klipspringer and porcupine, they make up a huge percent of the leopard diet in this region. So about... Um, 62% of the relative biomass of um, food consumed by leopards in this area are those food sources. So snaring can have a real effect on the prey availability for leopards and, and can have a, a real impact on them. We ended up taking um, this project, kind of this questionnaire project and this response to the next level by instigating a snare patrol project for a year within the same region. And we had a snare officer who um, walked 1,400 kilometers on foot and he surveyed um, many of the same farms where the interviews were conducted. And he actually ground truth the information that the informants told us. So they were telling us how many snares they thought were um, being put on their properties and, uh, and their farmers were telling us whether they snared or not. Um, sorry, their laborers were telling us whether they snared or not. But our snare patrol officer actually ground truthed it. He walked uh, all of the transects and uh, over um, 218 patrols, he removed almost 700 snares in this year. And uh, the data that he collected while removing these snares um, is, well, it has been analyzed and it's now getting prepared for um, publication. But um, we're now able to look at the different abiotic factors that are influencing where snares are being put. And this is um, important information to help us to create workshops for landowners and farmers about how to effectively conduct snare sweeps and where to um, really look for snares if you are going to do a snare sweep on your property. Um, so, you know, not just understanding the socioeconomic, but, but the geographical region um, for where snares are, are being placed is also very, very important for our work. Um, so we are busy trying to come up with mitigation strategies for snaring. So this, this involves education, it involves workshop, it involves creating resources. And uh, we're also looking at ways to include communities and um, try and improve the, the socioeconomic factors that are driving them to snare in the first place. But that's um, sort of a big complicated issue. So we've got to come up with, with clever strategies to do that, which is what we're working towards. Um, and finally, another threat that we have picked up on for leopards in the region 
um, that I feel like we've really just kind of understood the tip of the iceberg of is the use of leopard body parts by traditional healers. Um, so we had a, another questionnaire survey which has now been published, the results, and um, these interviews were speaking to 17 different communities within the Bolan region, so um, interviewing different traditional healers about the different species they use within their practices and how they use these different species. And we found that um, many of the traditional healers interviewed were using leopard. It was actually um, the leading species along with another species um, that was used the most commonly. And um, it was also recorded that leopards had the second most uses attributed to them. So this, um, this chart here shows the different species that were reported on. And um, within each of the species, we asked the healers, how many different uses do they have for this animal? And leopard was the second, um, had the second most uses. So it had 15 different uses. And uh, these really sort of varied from uh, a wide variety of things, from uh, protecting against evil spirits, to cold and flu treatment, to epilepsy treatment, to securing business success, um, to predicting the future. So there were many, many different uses that leopard body parts could be employed for. And um, we, we really wanted to know where traditional healers were sourcing their animal parts from. Um, obviously, this, this is very sensitive information and informants were quite reluctant to disclose the origin of the body parts. Um, but we did kind of get, get the impression from many of them that um, if they could get them locally, that was preferable. And then otherwise they would source them from further afield. And four respondents mentioned that local farmers supply them with animal carcasses in, ex in exchange for monetary compensation. So there certainly is um, you know, some local sourcing for body parts and um, for traditional medicine. And um, this, this could be very detrimental if um, leopards are being sourced and being utilized for this, because considering how low the population density of leopards is within the Cape and how big an area they need, um, the loss of even just a few leopards can have significant results. So um, this, this kind of cultural use of leopard is something we need to look into more and we need to understand um, the, the real sort of, um, situation um, about it and try and come up with with sensitive and um, and smart ways to to deal with this going forward. So um, I've kind of outlined a few of the threats to leopards in the Cape. I, I feel like it's been a bit doom and gloom so far, but um, I'd like to kind of turn it around a bit more by uh, showing you a little bit about where we're going and uh, some of the exciting stuff that's happening to make sure that leopards do persist for future generations. So we're working on the moment at uh, creating this large database um, of information about leopard distribution and threats to leopards all across the Western Cape. Um, it's, it's a really exciting project and we're collecting data not just from now, but uh, going back in time to 2010. Um, we have an online app, uh, which is just here in the middle in blue, and uh, we're really calling on citizen scientists to share any camera trap photos they have or spore photos or anything they can give us. Um, and all of this information that's being collated is going to be examined soon to understand leopard habitat suitability and to help us identify these ecological corridors. And um, we really hope that you'll be able to contribute to this and, and help us to push forward our, our really important drive to do environmental education and conservation work and research on these leopards of the Cape to make sure that uh, this, this sort of worrying trend that is being seen globally for leopards um, can be reversed before it's too late and, and so that we can keep leopards in the Cape um, for the future because they are such an important part of our ecosystem and our culture and our pride here. Um, so yeah, please do get in touch with us if you have any questions, if you can share any data and um, thank you for listening. Okay, um, so someone was asking about the different designs of snare. 
So um, we did find when we did the snare patrol and we removed those almost 700 snares, we recorded um, detailed information on the different types of snares that were being used. The majority of them were wire snares. Um, there was a few that was used from different uh, materials such as um, kind of nylon rope was also used, but it was pretty similar in terms of design. They were mainly that sort of slip, slip loop um, shape out of um, wire. And um, they were just set up in different locations and different sizes um, to tailor it for different uh, species that were being targeted in different habitats. Um, but yeah, in terms of the design, it was pretty synonymous. Um, how many people are setting snares in the area? It's, it's hard to say in terms of how many people because um, yeah, like it's hard to know whether just one person has gone out and set 20 snares or if it's 20 different people who've gone out and set one snare each. Um, so that's something that will require a bit more research um, to really find out information on. But one thing that, that was interesting about the snare patrol work was that um, we ended up doing the snare patrol um, survey um, within the first sort of six months of the year. And then we went back and we resurveyed the same areas in the second six months of the year to see if, um, for example, the snares that we found um, were, for, they could have been very old snares um, to see if snares were being put um, into the environment regularly. And we did find that uh, we found a similar number of snares removed during the first six months as the second six months, which, which shows that it was like a continual ongoing thing. It wasn't just old snares that could have been there for 10 years. It is an active process. Um, but the results from our snare work, um, there's gonna be a publication uh, in the next year, I hope, uh, with a little more detail on that. So we'll be able to give a bit more information soon. Um, Julia was asking, do you have some idea of how the population is faring in the region? Is it increasing, decreasing or stable? So Julia, that's a, that's a very good question. And that is something that we are in the process of finding out. So we are doing um, population density estimates, and then we will be resurveying those same locations at regular intervals to be able to determine what the trend is. And uh, at the moment, uh, we have only just started this process of resurveying. So um, we don't yet have these answers for you, but um, we're working on it and we will be able to kind of tell you in a few years time a bit more information on that one. Okay, uh, um, a couple more questions coming in. Um, one from Matthew asking um, what you think is happening in the picket bag and why it's different. Okay, um, so just I think maybe I should give everybody a little com uh, context on where that is because anyone who's not local might not uh, know. Um, but the Paketberg is a, an area of the Western Cape. It's, it's um, towards the Cedarberg, so north of Cape Town into the mountains. Um, there's, there's a kind of area called the Cedarberg Wilderness, which is quite famous. And then just to the west of that is um, an area called the Paketberg, which is largely an agricultural area. So there's a lot of livestock farming there. Um, it's still quite mountainous and there is um, uh, a lot of leopard activity within the Paketberg. Um, and one of the things that we have um, been picking up is that there is a fair bit of conflict in the Paketberg. So we've, we've been going out and responding to that. And um, we've been working with the farmers there. And um, I think what Matthew is trying to ask is, is more about sort of why there's conflict in the Paketberg. Um, so I hope I've got that right. Um, but, um, you know, we, we do think that perhaps the, the leopards have moved into Paketberg um, fairly recently. So um, according to our sources, um, it hasn't been something that's been going on there for, for sort of multiple decades. It's been a fairly newish, um, phenomenon and some of the farmers there it's it's kind of their first time experiencing conflict so they're just uh, working out how to live with lepers and what the best scenario is and some of the lepers are perhaps moving across from areas such as the Cedarberg through some of the corridors um, so I think that it is a bit different uh, in terms of 
you know, the farmers are adapting to this situation. They're maybe not always um, that well supported and, uh, you know, the, the sort of leopard situation is something that we're trying to find out more about and um, I believe other organizations are as well. Um, so this is kind of a, an ongoing area that we'll hopefully be finding more about soon. We, we've got a master's student who's just done some research in the Bukettberg, so her research will hopefully help us give us a clearer picture on what's going on there, what the density is like, and, uh, and what the conflict is um, looking like as well through her questionnaire surveys. Logic. Right, there's a couple more questions. Um, one from David Thompson asking, has anyone analysed the demographic impact of snaring things like um, mortality and population size? That's that's a very good question. Um, I, I Not that I'm aware of, to be honest, David. Um, there might be in another survey, but um, yeah, so at the moment, um, we, we have had a few reports of leopard mortality from snaring, but it's actually a very, very small sample size. So it's only like a few individuals. So it would be hard to kind of look at the demographics of that. Um, and I think that the snaring is having a bigger effect in terms of the loss of the, the prey um, base for the leopards. And that's, that's obviously um, a little bit harder to, to understand how that's impacting the leopards because it's less of a direct impact than, um, than them being killed. So I think much more work is required on snaring. And I think what would be really nice um, is if we can kind of um, assimilate our information on snaring with other projects across the country or even across the whole region so that um, we have a big enough data set and we have kind of uh, comparative areas to try and break down trends in what's happening with snaring. Um, so I, I definitely would love this research to be done. More research on snaring is really, really needed. So um, more of a collaborative approach would be great. Um, so very keen for that. Um, 